Hello, I'm Professor Ross Melnick. Uh, this is the John H. Mitchell Television Archivist at UCLA Film and Television Archive, Mark Quigley, and we're joined by sound restorationist Nick Berg. We're here to talk Hello. about Stars of Jazz. Mark, I'm going to start with you. Um, can you tell us a little about the UCLA Film and Television Archive? Well, we're the second largest film archive in the United States, uh, second only to the Library of Congress. Um, these are big collections of just moving image media. So when we're talking about the film and television archive at UCLA, we're strictly talking about uh, films and television programs. And that can encompass everything from home movies to kinescopes like, like we're watching tonight. So we don't collect stills, we don't collect papers, we don't collect manuscripts, although there are collections at UCLA that do that. We strictly collect the moving image. And these collections go back from the dawn of cinema to the present. So what does a television archivist do? Well, uh, collect, protect, catalog, and share. And so what we're doing tonight is share um, and pulling together a project like this. So a project like this starts with a grant opportunity. Um, the Grammy Foundation, which is part of the Grammy Museum, uh, offers preservation grants. And then you kind of have to find something in your collection that's a good project, something that needs to be done, something that you want to do, and something that fits within the budget of a, of a Grammy grant. In this case, uh, I had the idea to try to do something with um, Stars of Jazz, because in the past we did an experiment where we married some higher quality audio of a Billie Holiday uh, appearance on Stars of Jazz with a kinescope. Um, and it was, it was really, a good, it was a really good project. The one thing that kind of bothered me about it was that when you had Bobby Tripp talking, when you had the incidental parts between the music, it was very low fidelity. And then Billie Holiday comes on singing in stereo and high fidelity, and it was, it was very jarring. It kind of made you realize you were hearing something uh, different quality. And so in putting together this project, the idea was to bring on somebody like Nick Berg that could kind of help marry the audio um, and feather in the, the incidental parts of it that weren't just the music. So you didn't have very low quality and then higher quality. So a television archivist, to answer your question in a long roundabout way, uh, putting together projects like this is part of what we do in, in addition to collecting and preserving. And so where was this footage and how did this project start? I mean, what was the, you know, the, the legacy of the, of, the, of the elements and then how did you uh, start to think about putting it back together in a way that you could, um, you could present? Well, the archive was really lucky for about 40 years. We had a gentleman by the name of Dan Einstein that was our television archivist and he's, he's still around. He just retired um, two years ago. And he was very good at finding and he was a magnet for great collections. And one of the producers of this program, Jimmy Baker uh, and his family uh, decided to donate kinescopes of this program that survived. So if, for those that don't know, a kinescope is a recording of a television program, of a live television program off of a television screen. And this was before videotape. And this was a way that a program could be recorded and sent to another market if it needed to go back east or somewhere else or it could be repeated, although well, they didn't repeat kinescopes too often. Um, not great picture quality. If you noticed a difference in the picture quality between the first program and the second, that's because the first program was a 35 millimeter network kinescope. Um, so 35 millimeter being the larger film, uh, gauge, so more information. It's a, just a better quality kinescope than the second one. But kinescope is not known for its picture quality or its audio quality, so and the idea of marrying these two things together. But So these, these materials have been at UCLA for decades. We've done different preservation, preservation projects with Stars of Jazz, and uh, some of the Stars of Jazz episodes came to us as unmarried picture uh, and track negative, meaning um, you know, unmarried picture and sound. And so previous preservation projects were simply creating a new comp print of uh, those two elements, of the separate negative and a separate sound, uh, to a new comp element that you could project, because this was before the digital revolution. So we, the way that we used to screen these, if we did a public program, would be to screen a 16 millimeter print. Um, and now with, you know, in the digital era, we have different opportunities to try to do different things. And, and sometimes that's good, and sometimes it isn't always as good. Uh, so this is just another progression where we're still working with materials and, uh, that came to us in, you know, decades ago, but we're working with them in different ways. Um, just a question about the show itself. I mean, you're a television archivist. You've looked at a lot of TV. What strikes you about this, this show? Like, why should we uh, 
be excited about looking at it uh, more than half a century later? Well, you know, in the late 50s, you have the civil rights struggle happening, you know, to have uh, a television program, and this program did get carried, picked up by the network for a while, um, that's highlighting African-American artists in a way um, that's extremely uh, referential. Uh, it's obvious Bobby Troop is, recognizes this talent for what it is. These are, you know, the best musicians in the world, and it's a, it's a showcase for an American art form, jazz, and it's a showcase for Afri African-American musicians that just really didn't exist. Um, you know, there's other examples. I mean, Ed Sullivan <coughs> was a real integrationist and was putting a lot of black artists on, on the Ed Sullivan show. But this is a devoted half hour to, you know, the Modern Jazz Quartet. That's an avant-garde, you know, jazz band um, on television. The, the program itself is filmed in a way that's very modern. If you look at the lighting techniques and the, and the staging, you know, it's very much of the time. It's very avant-garde also. So it's, it's a unique program. There was another show done on, uh, in Los Angeles called Frankly Jazz that was uh, on KTLA that was similar. And we actually just acquired some original two-inch tapes of that show. I'm excited to start working on those and hopefully with Nick uh, on those also in, in a different way. Um, but there just isn't a lot of programs like this. And you know, jazz is sadly, it's recognized as a great American art form, but it's, it's underappreciated still. And this was an opportunity for people to tune on and see you know, magnificent live performances happen right before their eyes. So when you started working on the, the restoration of this material, what was your like logistical, philosophical, ethical questions about working on it? Yeah, I mean, for me, this was, I was really a project manager, um, and other people did the hard work, uh, Nick especially. Uh, you know, I had this idea, wow, what if we tried to do what we did before with the Billie Holiday episode that was successful for the technology of the time, and use modern tools to do it maybe a little bit better, um, and then, you know, the challenge is, well, where do you get the elements from? You know, we have episodes that survive as stars of jazz, um, but then you have to go out and find the audio elements, and that's where um, UCSB was extremely helpful, and, and David Soybert in your special collections uh, was, you know, a huge part of making this happen by uh, going through a collection that wasn't yet processed to, f to find the audio that we needed. And, you know, there was one episode that I wanted to do that we weren't able to get audio elements for, we um, searched all over. The LA Jazz Institute was another entity. Uh, Nick went on searches for me, and we, we tried our best. And we, we did four episodes total. We only showed you two tonight. Um, but uh, UCSB and was you know, instrumental in providing sound sources that we didn't have. And I, mean, I can let Nick explain a little bit. Maybe you want to talk about how these other sound sources uh, kind of existed, because it's an interesting story. Sure, yeah. Uh, so the kinescopes have an optical track, either the 16-millimeter uh, the or the 35-millimeter optical track. Um, but at the same time they made those, they also made a tape copy. And that tape copy was used uh, to make a 16-inch uh, transcription record uh, that was sent out for, for armed forces radio, right? Yeah. Um, and then later, uh, decades later, I guess, right, um, those tapes were used again to make LP releases. Uh, so all three of those were used for, for each of the episodes. So the LP audio was the highest quality audio, but it had no speaking in it. It was only the music. Uh, the second best was the 16-inch uh, transcription. Um, so most of the speaking comes from the 16-inch transcription. And then in any instances where there's a reference to like the next episode or uh, the advertisements, things like that, that, that's all off the optical track. So it was constantly going between the optical, the 16 inch and the LP and then back and up, back then back and forth. Um, so, um, but, 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 but I was thinking as well that, um, uh, so even the, uh, the kinescope is optical, but that's, that's not necessarily how it was heard at the time because it was live TV. Uh, and so what was heard at the time is more like what we're hearing now, the LP audio, than, than it is the optical track. So Maybe I can go back a second. Nick, can you tell us about your, your company and the kind of work that you do with, with, with uh, shows like this and other and film, and so, et cetera? Sure, yeah. I mostly specialize in kind of uh, uh, specialty odd projects, things like this, uh, where there's, there's uh, like difficult elements, bring, bring elements together. Um, Everything from uh, stuff from the late 1890s all the way up to like 1998. I'm working on a film right now, but yeah, so it's it's a big mix. But 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 it's usually things that are complicated and problematic. 
Yeah. <laughs> so when you work with an institution like UCLA and they come with you with a complex audio problem, how do you, what, what kind of situations do you face? How do you address those issues? And is it more that you work with someone directly with like Mark or is there a team or how do you approach a project just like this one? Yeah, the, the first step and I think, I think the most important is just doing the initial experimentation as far as uh, you know, what the sound quality is gonna be like after, from all the different elements, uh, how it's gonna sync up, how, how we're gonna exploit the different ones, and then uh, you know, working with Mark, you know, how you wanna address uh, you know, the aesthetics of it or whatever. Um, you know, in a typical Hollywood motion picture restoration scenario, uh, you know, we do have situations where there are original music cues so that uh, you, know, you have your optical track or something, and we have this ability to bring in this higher fidelity music. But in a situation like that, you, know, you really wanna keep uh, the drama and the narrative going, so you wanna take someone out of the experience, have this like, really amazing quality thing, and then come, come back down to the optical track. Uh, but, but this is a great, great opportunity where the music can be at the highest quality and everything else can kind of be shifted around that, so. Well, I was just gonna say, when, when an opportunity like this comes around, you know, the, the first thing you wanna do is, is, is get somebody like Nick that has all this expertise and has all the legacy equipment and you know, you're basically taking problems to, to you to, to solve and we come, then we kind of work together through the puzzle and you do have to make decisions you know, that sometimes result in a, maybe a compromise here gives you something better here or, or what's an acceptable, what are you willing to accept to try to meet your goals and that's where some of it you know, becomes philosophical or ethical discussions. I mean, <laughs> for something like this, these things, the, the audio's been heard in high fidelity you know, in the 70s when these LPs were released. The programs were originally watched. You know, if people had a good TV at home, like we were talking about earlier, somebody you know, in Beverly Hills that had a good TV <laughs> in 1957, uh, 56, was, was able to hear this in a really good way. But you know, as you saw them tonight, this is, the, this is the best that anyone has seen these two things together since the original broadcast and um, you know that's gratifying and we'll we may revisit this project you know other people revisit this project 10 years from now and do it in a better way maybe so one of the things we, that you hear a lot about is is the, the conversion to digital that everything's going digital including restoration but you really work on uh, collecting a lot of analog tools and right to, in order to get back to the fidelity of sound as it was in that moment i wonder if you could just talk about the opportunity or opportunistically collecting equipment that enables you to do your job better and if there's any kind of examples that you could pull out for why that's so important. Sure, yeah. Well, I mean, sound is very different than picture at the moment. So with picture, it's still kind of in a transition where, you know, we're going from 2K to 4K and there's 8K out there or whatever. But, uh, you know, in sound, we're kind of, we've been at kind of uh, the 8K level of sampling for, for a couple decades now. So it's really not the, the digital that makes much of a difference on the sound quality. It's really about the, the analog side and you know, with, with the records, you know, how to uh, choose the right stylus and the right turntable and that sort of thing. On the optical side, it's about the, the optics and the kind of mechanics and that kind of thing. Uh, so that's where the, uh, uh, the big sound quality improvements happen is really on the analog side, not, not with the, the digital side. Um, and so it's always kind of, kind of um, uh, you know, exciting and interesting like this to kind of be able to do some, some experiments with a different new media um, and try different things. So in this instance, you know, uh, since, since a lot of it was off a of record, you know, I would try different, different cartridges and style out to kind of do things um, so they would um, get, get as close to the optical uh, and then still have a higher fidelity. Yeah. So in terms of the principles of your, of your company when it comes to sound, what are the ways in which you kind of, the philosophies, if you will, of sound restoration that you sort of believe in, in terms of approaching this and many other kinds of projects? Well, I mean, I guess, uh, you know, the, the highest quality possible at all times, you know, but, but I mean, I really, um, you know, what that means, you know, I, I, I like to think about it a couple different ways. You know, the first, off is I'm always trying to get at least the fidelity that they heard then. And it seems like a simple thing, but you know, if you were at like the Robe in the 1950s or you know these these shows, it would have been really impressive. And uh, so th that's kind of like the um, uh, uh, the initial tier. You know, is it as good as they were hearing at least? And then secondly, is it 
uh, going to be, be a timeless thing where, you know, in 10 years or 15 years, I won't be able to improve upon it. You know, so, so it matches those things. I'm happy usually with, with the audio. So. Uh, Mark, maybe you would know this, but you probably both know this. If someone is interested in Stars of Jazz, where else could they turn to try to either see more episodes? Is there a, um, either an online or an offline way to watch more of this, to listen to more of this material, um, if someone's really excited about uh, hearing and seeing more of this? Of this? Well, um, through the UCLA Film and Television Archive, we have a research and study center on the UCLA campus. And anyone doing research on any kind of specific project um, can make an appointment to view materials there on site at UCLA. And we have at least, you know, 30 plus episodes that it would be pretty easily available for viewing. And, you know, so anybody that's interested enough, you know, that would want to come to campus to look at it can do that. I mean, the thing about this show is that many of the many shows uh, weren't kinescoped at all. Many kinescopes weren't saved. You know, at the time of production, the idea that these programs would have any kind of life beyond um, their initial broadcast wasn't something that was really considered. So the fact that um, you know even you know roughly 50 of these survive at UCLA is a bit of a miracle in itself. And of course, there's you know there's guests that were on there that we would like to see that may turn up, but a lot of it was probably just thrown away, um, never to be found again. And there's lots of television that falls into that category, and that's especially true. You know, kinescopes cost money. It costs money to um, have a kinescope made. Um, so a lot of shows didn't do it. And then when the tape era took hold in the early 60s, one of the big selling propositions was that, you know, with tape, it, the tapes could be reused. Um, and that was a way that production companies could save money. So there's, you know, anytime a two-inch tape survives with good content, it, to me it's a bit of a miracle because uh, a lot of times on the two-inch tapes there'll be a log on the inside and you'll see, you know, all kinds of great content. Could be like, you know, NASA, press conference, you know, Martin Luther King visits Los Angeles, and it'll be like 15 things crossed out, and the last thing will be like a game show that survived, <laughs> because they would just reuse, the, it was just all about money, and even big shows like, you know, um, The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson would not save all their tapes, and it wasn't until Carson took ownership of the show in, this, in the early 70s that they decided that they would keep all of those, um, which is a long way of answering your question yeah, that, you know, there are Stars of Jazz episodes that can be can be viewed at UCLA. They're not so easy to share online because um, anytime you have music, there's publishing rights um, that get complicated. Sync rights are, are expensive, and even the copyright of these programs is a bit uh, interesting. You know, they're they were produced by a local uh, television station that's owned by a major corporation. Um, so the rights to these are also tricky. So right now, these are kind of limited to on-site research at UCLA, the ones that survive, and there may be other episodes out there. There are the LPs that are out there uh, in bootleg circle. Well, not even bootleg circles. I mean, you can go on eBay. The company that originally released these, the LPs of these um, uh, broadcasts, they didn't necessarily have permission to do that, and there was actually a lawsuit, and they did get taken off the market in the 70s, but they're not too hard to find um, on eBay. So. Just to say that because so much of what we think now that a lot of content is online and streaming because everyone has, you know, the Disney, Disney has Disney Plus and there's this idea that, but there's so much of this legacy content, I mean, obviously, maybe 90, 95% of it will never be online, including a show like this. Yeah, the rights issues really cause complications because sometimes if something isn't owned outright by someone, it makes it even harder for it to get released. So if, if a, a major corporation doesn't feel they have an interest in this, they want to invest in it. Um, for an entity like a state university to put it online, you know, you have to get over the music rights. If you're serving it on, if you're trying to serve your video on something like YouTube, they have something called Content ID and they'll flag anything that has, you know, music publishing. So if you have a Gershwin tune on a show like this, it's going to get flagged and you're not going to be able to, you know, host it there for free. So um, it, it's a challenge. And something like this, you know, we, uh, that we get a grant to do, um, you know, when we have a screening like this, we can't um, charge admission because the rights to this are too complicated. And that goes all the way to like the guilds for the people that worked on these programs to the music rights and everything else. So uh, whether anyone would ever invest the money required to clear something like this properly to put it on a streaming service is, you know, dodgy at best that that will ever happen.
and thus such an important thing to show because it's one of the best ways we have to, to, to consume it. I think with that, maybe we'll, we'll open up the, the, the floor to questions. Uh, that way, people who are uh, want to ask questions, we can engage. Hi, I was curious, um, were the kinescopes missing the uh, original commercials? I know you have the network promos in there, but were the commercials, commercials missing from the kinescope? Yeah, the, the 35 network prints have uh, those, you know, the network spots. Some of the 16s kinescopes do have the local commercials uh, or the integrated commercials that um, Bobby Troop, they, Budweiser was one sponsor um, and the cigarette company was another sponsor. And so there are some episodes that have those. Just so happens the Basie was one that didn't. And then kind of in, in terms of choosing which episodes to do for this, uh, you know, the Basie episode is one of the best surviving episodes. I mean, in terms of the musical content. The modern jazz quartet episode with um, Herb Jeffries, I mean, that's just a beautiful kinescope. The music, the music is super interesting and it's, it's a great episode. There's another episode we did preserve with Nick that's um, a Max Roach episode that's really great. There's another one with um, the Lighthouse All-Stars and Julie London that had the commercials in it that was really great. And it's just, it's hard not to want to show that 35 kinescope because it's so gorgeous. And that was scanned by our digital lab and we didn't really talk about the the, the, the digital scanning of that, but you know these were scanned and actually scanned in 4K, um, but there wasn't really a lot of digital cleanup done on it. Um, but they, they look good. But there are com there are surviving commercials to answer your question. For some of them. Yeah, how come you don't see the uh, lines on the screen from the television with a kinescope? Maybe I don't understand what's done. You certainly s could see them in the 35 kinescope. Um, in the first one, they're they're there, but they used a, you know the the type of monitor that they used and the way that they the, the way the kinescope process worked. If it was done well, uh, it's not quite as noticeable as you would expect it to be. But it certainly is noticeable in the in, the, in that first one compared to the second one. But it's it's a it's a it's a crude way of recording a television program to be sure. And you can see that in the second episode, the Basie episode is not. You know, technically not as good a kinescope, but you can have kinescopes from you know very early um, in television. I and mean, we have a kinescope from '56, a, um, a CBS network kinescope that looks like a filmed program, but I mean it's it's it is a kinescope. Um, but it has to do you know with the type of screen, the type of television screen, and the distance of the camera to the screen, and you know it was it was a process that got perfected. But by the time it got perfected, kind of tape took over. I would just say that it's such an interesting thing, the whole concept of kinescopes, because if you look back to radio history, there are years of radio, especially the 1920s, where there's so little recorded. So you have an entire decade, a lot of that decade of radio history, actually, there is no rec record of it, because the whole notion of rewatching or re-listening to things had not really got into the mainstream. So just thinking about the importance of having kinescope is, is, is why we can sit here and look at it today. Yeah, and there's, there's so many instances where the reason why a kinescope was made was because they needed to show a sponsor or they were trying to record the program to show a sponsor so that they might take on a project, you know, take on sponsorship of a program. So there's a lot of happy instances where those might be the only fragments. And something that we were talking about recently was uh, Vampira here in Los Angeles, who is a local horror host, um, precursor to Elvira. And no kinescopes are known to survive, but there's, there's one piece of her p performing that character as part of uh, a kinescope of a program that was made for sponsors. It's called Keys to a Great Market, and it was ABC, KBC's way of sh you know, creating this kind of an industrial film to show sponsors. Um, the type of interesting program they, programming they had. So while, as far as we know, no kinescopes of Empire survive, it, it, there is that piece of her performance within this other kinescope program. It's kind of interesting. It's just happenstance how some things got recorded and some things didn't. I have a technical question for Nick. I was really astonished how you really didn't hear <coughs> the change in fidelity between the music and the spoken words. And I really wonder how you achieved it. I was thinking, did oh, well, you- Oh, thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> did you fade in yeah. to more higher fidelity or how was this done? Yeah, well, I mean, the critical thing really is the, uh, the disc that came from, from here, from UCSB. 
because um, the LP sound incredible, and that's what all, all the music is from typically. Uh, but you know, it's really a tough thing to go from the optical to the LP. Uh, so the uh, the 16 inch transcription records that have the um, uh, the speaking on them, uh, you know, are a really great way to kind of uh, start start to feather between the optical and then the um, high fidelity LP. So you're typically kind of hearing it going up, you know, from optical to the 16 inch to the LP, and then back down the same way from the LP to the 16 inch to the optical. But part of the challenge was. The uh, transcription disc edits didn't always match the audio <laughs> yeah, on yeah. <laughs> the kinescope. So, you know, there was edits where for Nick is really having to ping pong in mm -hmm. order to, you know, you're going to get as much good fidelity as you can. And that kind of goes to some of the things I was alluding to earlier where sometimes where we would have discussions, you know, like, well, you know, we're going to have to take the lower quality here in order to make this transition work because of the, the way that it was piecemeal in some places, because of the, sometimes the edits didn't make any sense either. They, right, they yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good point. So there, there were instances where, um, you know, there was holes out of the transcription disc, uh, and instead of kind of, you know, checkerboarding and going back and forth, it plays more naturally, just, just use the optical through that section. So, so you're not kind of bouncing back and forth, you know, so it's better just, just use the, uh, the same thing through, through that section, so. Um, and, uh, but things like the LP audio have, have no noise reduction, just some, uh, some little manual work, uh, but there's no, no digital noise reduction going on whatsoever. Thank you all so much. <laughs>